Blender has just made Lexus style animations super simple. And with all of the new nodes in Blender version 5, it becomes super easy to create Houdini style animations like this really easily in Blender. In today's video, we're going to break it down step by step so that even you can create this really easily. With that, let's go ahead and begin today's tutorial. In our default scene, we're going to bring our cursor to the junction of these two windows, click and drag to create a new window, and then switch this from the 3D viewport to the geometry node editor. Then we can press this plus button to create a new geometry node tree and tap N to remove that side panel. Now, if you want, you could use the group input itself, but I'm going to just add in a cube by deleting the group input and pressing shift A and searching for a cube primitive. Now this is what's going to determine how large I want the plexus to be. So I want it to be fairly large on the X axis. So I'm going to change that to maybe a value of 10. The Y axis can be a value of three and the Z axis can be a value of maybe five. So that is where all of my points are going to be distributed. So let's press shift A and search for a mesh to volume node. Now, yes, I could have just used a volume cube, but I think this method works just as much. So I'm going to keep it as is. And then I'm going to press shift and search for a distribute points in volume node. Now this is way too many points. So I'm going to reduce the density down to something like 0.1. And that should give me the number of points that I actually want. Next to actually move these points around, I'm going to press shift and search for a set position node. And I'm going to move the points based off of some noise textures. So if I just plug this in directly to the offset, they're going to move towards the top, right? So to prevent that, I'm going to uncheck normalize. And then to actually make them move around, I'm going to switch this from 3D to 4D and then press shift A and search for a scene time node. And I can choose the frame option and plug that into the W. Now, if I was to just play it, it'll be way too fast. So we can press shift A, search for a math divide node, plug that in between the scene time and the W input of the noise texture. And I'm just going to divide it by maybe a value of 20 so that it's a lot slower, but the motion is still very chaotic. So I'm going to reduce the detail down to zero and I'm going to decrease the scale down to maybe something like two. And then now if I play this, each point still remains within its own vicinity. So to amplify the amount by which the noise texture moves, I'm going to use a vector math node set to scale and then plug that in after the noise texture and increase the scale to something like five. So now you can see they all move a lot more. I think it's moving a little too fast. So I'm going to divide it by a value of 100 instead. So now we have motion that is over larger distances and the connections and disconnections should be a lot more noticeable now. Now we need to actually connect every point to every other point. And we've done this twice before, once in this particular video, which is before we had the repeat zone node, which I think was fairly complex to set up. And you needed a very deep understanding of geometry nodes to actually understand or create it. Then we got the repeat zones. So I created this tutorial where you learned how to do it using the repeat zone, which is essentially like a for loop within Blender. But Blender has now made it even easier with the for each element node, which is just like the repeat zone, except easier. The idea is, Suppose we have four points, we need to go through every single point and on each point, we're going to instance some particular line. And more importantly, we're not going to have to just do one line for each point, but we need on each point, one line that's going to go from it to itself. One more line that's going to go from this point to this point, one line that's going to go from here to here and one line that's going to go from here to here. So then on this point, we're going to have to put one point that goes from it to itself, one to this point, one to this point, one to this point, and so on and so forth. So that's why essentially it's going to be a nested loop that iterates through every point and then for each point, it iterates through every point again. So if there's only four points, one, two, three, and four, it has to go through each one by itself. So that would give a total of 16 iterations. So that's actually really easy to do. All we do is press shift A and search for a for each element node. And this is already going to iterate through every single point or edge or whatever you choose. But for now, we're going to choose point and then do something and give us an output. Now, if you just want to do something, but you don't want it to actually change the geometry, you can use this socket, but we are going to want the changed geometry. So we're going to use this particular output. So what do we want to change? The first thing that we want to do is add one line for every single point. So press shift A and search for a curve line. And we want the start point of each of these lines to be where the points actually are. So we need the position of the points. So let's press shift and search for a position node. And then if we plug this position into this 
for each element, what it's doing is it's taking this field value, which means it's separate for every single point and it's converting it to a single value for the point that is being taken care of during this particular each element node. So the element is going to give us a single point and this is going to be the position of that point. So we can plug that into the start. And then if we take this curve into the geometry output and plug this into the group output, you can now see that we have a curve line added in for every single point whose start point is at the location of the point, but the end point is whatever we gave as this particular input, which currently is a Z value of one, but you can change that around. So that by itself is really cool. But remember, we did not want just one curve for every point, but we needed one curve for every point at each curve. To actually understand this better, let's go ahead and open the spreadsheet so that we can actually see the values as they change. Right now, if we just had the points in, we had 15 points. So using the position of these 15 points, for every single point, we then added in a spline. So now we have 15 splines, but originally we needed 15 squared splines because for each spline, it should also go to every single point. So what we can do is nest a for each element node group within itself. So let's select this and just press shift D to duplicate it. And again, we want the position of every single one of these points, but the output of this for each element is what's going to actually go into the outer loop. Now the end position for each and every single one of these curves can come from this particular point and this curve can go into the geometry. So hopefully you understood what happened. As you see, there is the outer for each element loop, which is like our outer loop. And then within that, we have a sub for each element loop. So we have the start points coming in from the outer loop and the end points coming in from the inner loop so that from each element, the start is going to happen right over there and it's going to end at every single other element. And then it switches over to the next start point. And then again, it goes through every single element and ends at every other element. That's how you get a connection from each point to every other point, which means we get 15 square splines, which is 225 splines. That means we have a connection from each point to every other point. But there's one problem, which is this contains a lot of repeats because there is one spline that's going from this point to this point again. As there's a spline that's going from this point to this point per se, there's one spline that's going this way. And there's also another spline that's going back this way. So that causes a lot of repeat splines that we do not want. So to remove all of those, we can simply press shift A and search for a curve to mesh node, which converts all of our splines to edges and control points to vertices and then press shift A and search for a merge by distance node. As you can see, once we merge by distances, the number of edges and vertices drop dramatically. And this is definitely gonna help speed up the render when you have many more points. So for now, we have the correct number of points and lines, but we don't want lines that are this long. So we want to delete edges that are longer than a certain length. And that has also become super simple to do. We can just search for an edge length node and then compare if the edge length is greater than a specific number. So let's compare if this edge length is greater than, let's say two meters, then we want to delete the geometry. So press shift A, search for a delete geometry. And we're going to change this from point to edge because we want to delete the edges and we want to delete only the edges and faces. So let's plug that into the selection. And now we have all of the edges that are longer than two meters to be deleted. If you go ahead and reduce this, you reduce the number of lines. And if you increase this, you get more and more lines added in. So I think a value of five is good enough for this example. And that looks really cool. Now, if you play the animation, you have a complete working plexus, a true plexus, which is amazing. This would have taken so much more of a setup, as you can see over here, to get this working. But now it's just this small. But now let's go ahead and use Blender's new nodes to make this look even cooler. Instead of just having it as a plexus, we can make this organic, super cool looking plexus. And we do that using grids. If you don't know what grids are, you can definitely check this video out, which gives us an intuitive understanding of why the grid nodes have been incorporated into Blender and what they really are. But once you've watched that video, let's continue making this look a lot cooler. This output has the splines and the points. So the first thing that we want is to convert these points to actual spheres using grids. So we can do that by pressing shift A and searching for a points to SDF grid node. And the reason why we're using an SDF grid is so that we can actually use SDF Boolean operations like union later on. So we plug this points in over here and to actually visualize this SDF grid, we have to search for a grid to mesh node. And then we can plug this in right over there and take this output into the group output. 
So now you can see that this looks like it's very low resolution and you can increase that by changing the voxel size. So if we change the voxel size down to something like 0.05, you see we get a lot smoother spheres. And if you want to actually reduce the radius of this sphere, you can change that by changing the radius value to something smaller. So I think that looks really cool. And you see, just like metaballs, we can get them to actually interact with each other. But we can make this interaction even cooler by smoothening it out. So we can press Shift A and search for a smooth geometry node, plug that in right over here and increase the iterations to something like 50. And we get something that's super nice and smooth. So as you can see, in a situation like this, we have a nice metaball connection, but if we do not have the smooth geometry, this is what it looks like. It's not as cohesive as this. So here it just looks like a smoother transition, but that will also reduce the size of the spheres. So if you want, you can keep the radius up just a tiny bit to make this really nice. But that's just the spheres. Now we can actually create the connections between the spheres. For that, we're just going to go ahead and use the splines that were created over here. So we press Shift A and search for a mesh to curve node and plug this in right over there and then convert the curves back to mesh. So if we search for a curve to mesh, we now have a profile curve which we can add in and we can just plug this to the group output so you can see what's happening. The profile curve is going to be a nice curve circle that we can just plug in right over there and there you have it. But the radius is way too large. So let's reduce the radius to something like 0.5 and we could definitely just use really thin values to make the lines. but since I want to create something organic, I'm going to actually keep a value of 0.5 so that it looks really fat, but I'm going to change the profile of this to taper down towards the middle. Now to taper this down, we can use the scale value, but you need enough points. We'll see why we need points in a second by actually showing what happens if you don't add in the points. We can press shift and search for a spline parameter node and plug this factor into the scale. And that's going to create one large point here and a smaller point right over there for every single spline. But we can control that using a color ramp node, which we can plug in and we can add in four different stops. So let's just press this plus button twice and then keep these edge most values as a complete white. And then the middle values we can change to maybe a value of 0.4. And even this one can be a value of 0.4. And this one's position can be kept at a position of 0.4, whereas this one can be kept at a position of 0.6. But now you see, even though we have these, it isn't actually becoming thinner towards the middle. That's because, as I stated, we need to increase the resolution. So let's press Shift and search for a resample curve node. Plug that in right before the curve to mesh. And once you do that, you instantly get it. So let's increase the count to something like 200 so that it's nice and smooth. But as you see, we get a very sharp edge over here. And to fix that, we just change this from linear to ease. Now it's going to be a nice edge. Now that looks really cool. And you can also fill up these gaps by just choosing this fill caps node and now they're all going to be filled but there's still going to be these gaps so if you were to press shift and search for a mesh to sdf node and just view the sdf grid so we can actually plug that into the grid to mesh and plug that in right over here you'll see you get something nice but there's a lot of problems the first thing is the voxel size needs to be reduced so let's reduce this voxel size down to something like 0.05 again and remember the smaller the size the longer blender is going to take to calculate it but Essentially, we do get it. However, the issue is that in certain areas, you still have those little indentations and these don't really look like spheres. So to make these look perfectly like spheres, we can take the original spheres that we created over here and just add that in. And to add it, we can use an SDF Boolean node and then convert this from difference to union and just plug that in before the grid to mesh and connect in the original SDF grid for our points that we had to the SDF grid Boolean. So, so that way we get the spheres added in as well. And if you want to just increase the size of the spheres to make them even more prominent, you can increase that as well. Now you actually have the spheres present and you get this super organic sci-fi-ish material. Now the last few things that you have to do is go ahead and just set the shading to smooth. So press Shift A, search for a set shade smooth node, and then you can set the material to be whatever you want it to be. Now you see you get it very nice and smooth. Press Shift A, search for a set material node, plug that in right over here, and we can just use the default material because we're not using it for anything else. Now let's go ahead and switch this over to the shader editor. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to increase the roughness all the way to one. Also going to switch this over to rendered view so that we can actually see what we're doing. And I'm going to go ahead and increase the subsurface weight all the way to one. And since I want it to be mostly green, 
I'm going to reduce the blue down to a radius of 0.1 and increase this middle value to something like 10. And I'm also going to increase the scale up to like one meter. And now we get this nice little green, soft slime looking material. We can change the base color to also be slightly greenish. And there you go. Now you have a super organic slimy green color. If you want this to look even cooler, you can just switch on ray tracing and that's gonna add in these nice little dark areas. And if you want it to be even darker, you can press shift and search for an ambient occlusion node and a mixed shader node, and then plug the color of the ambient occlusion into the factor and ensure that this principal BSDF is in the second shader. If you want even finer control over it, first thing you can increase the distance to make it more prominent. And you can use a color ramp node right after the ambient occlusion node to just increase the amount of darkness or ambient occlusion that is present. So this is what it's gonna look like in EV. You can add compositing if you want, such as going to the compositor, adding in a new node tree and just searching for a bloom node. But all of that is your own personal preferences. You can go ahead and place these lights in different regions to actually glow through the material to make it look like toxic live slime. But to actually make it look like Houdini, you can always switch it over to cycles and play around with it to get something that's truly amazing. However, Cycles takes way too long to render, at least for me. So I'm going to have to stick to Eevee for the time being until I get a better PC. For the output, you can go ahead and render it out as a video. However, once you're happy with the way everything looks, you can set up your camera and render this out to create amazing animations. This was a 3D Texas, but I'm going to create a 2D version that's going to be a part of my first Gumroad product, which is going to be a 2D motion graphics customizable asset pack. I'm going to create a few dedicated videos to that in the coming few days, but I'm genuinely happy with the way the product came out and I hope it'll give all of you a lot of value. So if you do want to support this channel to create more free tutorials like this for everyone, consider purchasing my new GeoMo 2D asset pack, or you can buy just this particular model as a one-time purchase on my Patreon. I will have a lot of new tutorials coming out. So until those come out, thank you so much for watching. Keep creating and don't forget to stay creative.